Good morning, Utah. <laughs> and good morning, Christian. I'd like to say that I feel great, but I don't. <laughs> I'd like to tell you that the world is a wonderful place, but it's not. There's a lot of things I'd like to tell you, but unfortunately, I'd be lying if I did. The one thing I can tell you is that God is with you. God loves you. God doesn't have a wonderful plan for your life, but God has a wonderful plan in eternity for those that would call upon the name of the Lord. There is that with which God has provided for you should you choose to follow through with the plan of salvation that God has so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever believeth in Him shouldn't perish, but rather they should find that way of eternal life that eternality of existence that God has provided a way that you would be able to escape those things that are about to come upon the world. The great tribulation, the frustration of the nations, the aggravations of the realization that war doesn't solve war or that violence doesn't solve violence. That really the only way that you can solve anything is by the nature with which it is created. When you come back to a creator, you find that God can create things. Man cannot. Everything that man does is to dis desecrate or to denigrate or to bring down creation rather than to lift up creation. In a way, you could say greenies were sort of right, except for they went to the extreme. It's not about renewable energy or about making ourselves into technological, you know, intelligent beings that are enslaved and addicted to our technology that should you take away our smartphones we're no longer smart or you take away our iPhones we don't have an identity or you take away a lot of things that involve technology and suddenly people say well we've lost our identity somebody stole it well how can someone steal your identity you are you and God knows you and that's the point that we need to realize is that we don't come from our environment, but rather we change our environment to reflect who we are. A lot of people get that backwards in life. They'll spend their life building their own little world or their own little kingdom. They'll spend their time investing in a career choice or a job environment. And suddenly one day, they won't be able to work in that environment and they lose their way, they lose their sense of identity because their purpose was wrapped up in their job. Their identity was identified by that with which they did with their hands. Now God said that's okay if you want to invest your time into mammon, into those things that man has made, those things that man has done and those things that man will do, much like the Gentiles Jesus talked about that the Gentiles would exercise lordship over one another. The Gentiles would seek after jobs and providing for themselves. As a matter of fact, there's an interesting thing that people say that, you know, socialism is such a bad thing, and yet Jesus, in some ways, talked about socialism. Oh, he talked about working, but he talked also about this commonality of existence that, is, that the Father loves all equally. And there's something about that to be said that we as a culture in America have diversified ourselves to such a degree that we've lost our way. We don't know today who we are. We don't know what we are. We don't know where we're going. Well, Christian, I got good news for you. I do. I know who I am, and it's not by what I've done in my life. I know where I'm going, and it's not because of the greatness of my intellect or my intelligence and it's not because of the things that I've learned along the way. I know who has saved me from myself because I know that I have to deny myself and take up my cross and follow Jesus because Jesus is the one who saved me from myself. If I had gone my own way, if I had learned to live the way that most Christians learn today, then I would be misled and led astray. Because you see, I'm following someone I know personally that has spoken to me and has directed me every day of my life. And whether I'm in joy or sorrow, whether I'm in health or wealth, whether I'm in prosperity or poverty, I know that I won't turn away from him because I turn towards him every day. This is the day the Lord has made and he wants you to turn towards him. 
to recognize that God has so provided the day that you should live according to the measure of faith you've been given. That direction that God wants you to recognize and be thankful for what He has done in your life. It's not enough to simply go about your way and say, okay, on Sunday I'll talk to God. But rather every day God has said, look, this is eternal life, that you should know me and know him who sent me. And that's what the Son of God came to do, to reveal what eternal life is going to be. You're not going to be in heaven sitting around playing harps. And you're not going to be in heaven riding Harleys, you know, from one star to another. You're not going to be taking anything of man's ideas about heaven or some childish idea that some kid has run around the world saying that he's seen heaven. Rather, you're going to fall down on your face and acknowledge the creator of the universe that he is the Lord of all to the glory of God the Father, that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So we have a duty, we have an honor, we have a responsibility to live up to the measure of faith we've been given. If God has so saved you, then God is directing you to do something with your salvation. If you're no longer a profitable servant, then you are to be cast away into the utter darkness, and God will not allow those who have not been used by him or filled by him or directed by him to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So there is a certain amount of responsibility to respond to grace and let grace accomplish in us that recognition of mercy and loving kindness that God the Father has for us. But there's also those that we talked about before that Jesus warned of weed and tares, that that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And if you sow to your flesh, then of your flesh you'll receive the whirlwind. But if you sow to the spirit, those things that are of the spirit, the peace of God that passes all understanding, the love of God that God has so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the joy of the Lord which is your strength. If you so involve yourself in the fruit of the spirit, then you'll find yourself in heaven rejoicing in the presence of God when he appears for he shall appear soon. But if we do not do those things that God has told us to do, then God will cast us away as an unprofitable servant. The warning is clear and it's always been there. Jesus has said all these things in the parables, in his teachings, and in the word of the Lord that he's brought to us. We ought to return to our first love. There are many that listen to and read about the church and religion. They look to the Word of God and they say, Well, God spoke to me in Deuteronomy, so I'm going to obey the Ten Commandments. Well, God spoke to me in, you know, the greatest commandment of all, so I'm going to honor the Golden Rule. Well, God spoke to me in, well, you're going to stand before God. Are you sure you want to say God spoke to me? Because the reality of what we're doing is going to be made manifest by the response that God gives to us when we stand in His presence. Don't fool yourself to think that God is mocked and that whatsoever you do won't be held accountable to you. For myself, I know every year at about this time when Yom Kippur comes around, whether I like it or not, I'm held accountable. God allows me to see my year and to see my day and to see my month and to see my seasons. And sometimes I say, oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. For I too am the chiefest of sinners. I have fallen short of the measure of grace that I've been given. I likewise, like you, have not measured up to the standard of Jesus Christ. I haven't given all that I have to follow Jesus. Have you? Have you given up your house, your home, your car, your friends, your neighbors, your wife, your children? Or are you rather taking God and applying it to your life? A lot of American Christians have become Gentile in their way of faith. They no longer deny themselves, but they look to getting what they got and giving what they can whenever they want to give to God something other than what God has desired and wanted from them in the beginning, which was all of them. If you don't seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things will profit you nothing. They will burn and be consumed in hell. This whole world is going to pass away and everything you see is going to burn. So when you put yourself into your job or your, your technology, when you put yourself into mammon and you invest yourself into your flesh, you'll find that you're going to reap the whirlwind. It's going to make no sense at all. But when you turn your life over to God and you lay it down at the feet 
looking to the cross and Jesus and seeing him dying there and saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, you realize there's got to be something more to Jesus than what meets the eye. There's got to be more to this life of faith than just simply getting church and getting religious. Rather, there's got to be something that we can take from our momentary existence here on this earth and realize that there's more to living than simply getting what we got. Rather, I dare, to tell, I, I dare say to tell you the truth, there is something more that God wants you to do, and that's to give what you got, to give away everything that you have, and to follow Jesus. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Jesus, is what the gospel was. What the gospel is today is that you have to admit that you're a sinner, and God knows that's easy to do. You can go to a concert and do that. You have to admit that Jesus died for your sins. Well, that's easy to do. That's part of the, you know, Constitution, isn't it? I mean, that's the way most people think. God knows you have to admit that, you know, you've done all these things that you can't manage your life and that you want God in your life. So you go, oh, I'll take him, you know, as long as I have a purpose and a direction, I'll take what God is giving and then I'll do what I'm living. Well, no, you aren't. You see... If you don't have a personal relationship and you don't begin to develop that personal relationship, then you're going to walk the way of religion. You're going to find yourself lost in a church that is probably heading the wrong way. That is one of the lukewarm churches or one of the churches that's propagating this idea that you can do your own thing, that you can live your own way. Now, one of the things that people like to argue about is that somehow the purpose-driven life is the wrong way to think of life. No, it's the right way if God is giving you your purpose. But if you're giving you your purpose, you're in the wrong purpose. Your porpoise has become your purpose and you're flying by the seat of your pants because God has a purpose for your life. But he will tell you that purpose, not you go out and live your life and then add God to it. A lot of people want their cake and eat it too and they'll take their ice cream and just follow through in this society of indulgence. America is a very selfish country. We deal with and do with what we see in front of our eyes in the momentary thought process that we just do what we're inspired to feel like doing. We don't often follow through in the long term. For instance, a Christian ought to be loving as they are giving and giving as they are loving. <coughs> and yet, if we took as our first citizen, the President of the United States, how do we treat our first citizen of the United States of America? How do we indulge ourselves in responding to that person that we're required to pray for? How do we deal with the people that we decide we don't agree with? Do we suddenly give up Christianity and say, oh, well, now we're political. We are involved in the democracy. We are involved in the republic. We are involved in this, this capitalistic society to where we have to deal with these certain issues that are resolving themselves whether we like it or not and God is going to hold us accountable and judging us for those things that we have not done with this society but rather we've chosen to follow we the people is that really what God requires of us what does God want for us what does God respond to us how does God deal with us the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. In those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be brought, sought for, and there shall be none. The sins of Judah they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I reserve. Thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity? All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. The Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. That is the purpose we're here for. You're not here to save yourself. You're not here to save your family. You're not here to get for yourself and your family those things you want for yourself and your family. You are here to learn to live with the living God inside you who cares so much for the world that he desires for you 
to go out and demonstrate to the world the love that he has for the entire world. There is never a moment of your life that you're living that you should be able to turn to someone and say, I hate you. There is never a moment of your life that you should turn to someone and say of your enemies, I want you dead or I want to kill you. There is a never a moment of your life that you should take up the sword or take up the cross or take up the gun and shoot someone and kill them. But rather, you should take up your cross, deny yourself, and hang on that cross, your own flesh that would desire to kill any human being, and say to them that are crucifying you, that are against you, that are fighting against you, and that are those that you would hate, and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That is your destiny. That is your calling. That is your election. That is what God wants you to be able to do. You are to be a reflection of the Son of God living inside you. For if you are not a reflection of Jesus in you, then your salvation has profited you nothing and you are bound for hell. The only way that we're ever going to enter into the kingdom of heaven is when we learn to live and we learn to forgive. For if you forgive those that you have ought against, and you know that they are nice and wonderful and happy people, then what different are you from the heathen that do the same thing? But rather, as your Father in heaven has commanded you and has told you, if you do not forgive others, you will not be forgiven. So you must forgive your enemies. You must choose to love your enemies. You must demonstrate the love of God in your life to such a degree that people will say, yes, Look how easy it is to kill those Christians. Yes, look how easy it is to break into a Christian's home and kill their wives or their children. Yes, look how easy it is to crucify all these Christ-likeness. Because that's what the word Christian meant. That's what the word Christian was, and that's what the Christian word was as a derogatory slur. Christians were easily walked upon. Christians were stolen from. Christians were the ones that you could beat them, you could cheat them, you could lie to them, you could steal from them, you could treat them like dirt. And they responded in loving kindness. That is what a Christian is. If you want to know what Jesus would do, Jesus said he committed judgment unto his Father and he would let his Father judge in the end. You likewise are called to the same. Don't tell me about what will happen if someone should break into your home that you will defend them tooth and nail and shoot them and kill them. Rather, tell me that you'll deny yourself and you'll act like a Christian. And you'll love them and you'll care for them and you'll pray for them. Because that's what happened in all of these places when you saw children stand up and say, I'm a Christian, but I want to tell you about Jesus. And we're killed. If a child can so lead the way in Colorado, then what are we to say to men and women of God who deny the ability for the Spirit of God to work in their life by taking up their guns and taking up their self-defense and taking up themselves and living according to the measure of flesh with which they should have been living after the things of the Spirit. Oh God, help us. For this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us turn again to the Lord our God. Let us ask Him again what we should be doing. Let us put aside the ways of the world and no longer live after the flesh but rather choose to live after the things of the Spirit. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus, that you should know the Son of God and know the Father who sent him.